Welcome, everyone. It says we are in the broadcast. We are live at five. I am so excited for everyone to be here. Welcome to Pure Dog Talks Live at Five. I'm your host, Laura Reeves. And while everybody is hopping on, I've got a couple super cool announcements. And in case you haven't heard, um, back in September, we launched a new exclusive perk for our patrons only. Pure Pep Talk is a weekly text message with an upbeat, fun, sort of educational tidbit. You can win prizes. Let me talk to you about the people that have already won their Pure Dog Talk wine cup. You can sign up for the patrons group and the Pep Talk messages for as little as $5 a month. Although Natalie is going to yell at me and she's going to tell you it's really 10 but I'm saying. Uh, it's still less than a uh, uh, frappuccino at your favorite coffee stand for a whole month. Uh, we've streamlined a lot of the offerings for the patrons. We've made a new patrons group. The pure pep talk group is its own thing. We've grown our existing all access patrons group to a community network of judges and breeders and experts and exhibitors. And they're all there with the same goal. You guys, your passion is our purpose. And it is that community of friends that you've all been looking for. Now, next up, if you haven't had a chance to check out the ebook, audiobook, download offering, How to Stack Your Dog is part of it, the link will be in the chat and that'll take you there. It's a great option to share with your puppy buyers, your friends that are looking for a well bred, purebred dog, all that, that sort of thing. And swag, swag. We've got some new items that just came out in the last month or so. They're on the swag store. Once again, link will be in the comments so you can wow your friends at your next event. I know that we've had swag represented at the Afghan National, the Berger Picard National, and a variety of other options. So be cool, be in the cool kids club, grab your swag while you got it. Um, now, our topic this evening on our live at five is a hot take. We're doing a hot take, you guys. I'm, I'm getting on the hot seat just for you. Um, purebred versus purpose bred, right? And are they the same? Are they different? Are they, are they sometimes both? Might be. So let's get started. First of all, Purebred and purpose-bred dogs are not, and I want to emphasize this, not mutually exclusive terms. Many purebred dogs are bred for a purpose. Many purebred dogs fulfill the purpose for which they were originally bred and created. Many do not, and yet they are still bred for a purpose, on purpose, for a purpose. And so I think that's important to understand. And it's important that we understand that the enemy of my enemy is my friend and our enemy, whether we are breeding purebred dogs or purpose bred dogs is not each other. And that is something we have got to get our heads around. Our enemy is the animal rights agenda and the people who would have us, none of us, any of us, able to breed dogs. And so the more that we can find common ground and common purpose, the better off we're gonna be. So that's how I'd really, really wanna start this. Um, I recently, this, this entire conversation was triggered by a post that I saw. Uh, one of our patrons invited a group of people to join the patrons because they had asked, they wanted community, they wanted friends, they wanted a support system. I'm like, hey, come on, join us. And like, oh no, pure dog talk is anti crossbred dogs and anti purpose bred dogs. And I'm like, no, that's not actually true. So we're gonna, we're gonna take a deep dive in this. You guys drop your comments, drop your questions, drop your challenges, go for it. Let's have it, let's have at it. We're gonna be polite, required, we're going to be on point, required, and we're going to be um, productive. Let's put it that way. We're going to think of ways that we can collaborate, not compete. And I think that's 
critical, whether we're talking about purebred, purpose-bred, cross-bred, doesn't matter. We're all trying to accomplish something. And I think that being able to respect all sides of that uh, perspective is very, very important. We're going to have a special guest join us here in a little bit, but I want to I wanna just have a little conversation first off and kind of set some parameters here. So purebred versus purpose-bred. <clears throat> One of the things we're going to talk about is time frame. Purebred dogs are history. They are living history. But it doesn't mean they're irrelevant today. Uh, German wire hair pointers were created by foresters in Germany in the late 1800s to do very specific jobs that they felt they couldn't get another dog to do. They represent that time of the Industrial Revolution and the changing of purebred dogs only belonging to the rich and the powerful and hunting dogs only belonging to the aristocracy and and the people in the industrial revolution these common man the regular guy couldn't afford to have a pointer to point and a and a, a spaniel to flush and a retriever to retrieve one teeny tiny little partridge for his dinner he wanted something that could do all the jobs and so he created the german wire hair pointer and the German wire hair pointer, I'm using this as an example, but we could use many, many, many of the other breeds that exist today as purebred dogs. He wanted a dog that could hunt fur and feather, who could retrieve on land and in water, who could dispatch small predators that were decimating the wild bird population, and he could guard hearth and home. Okay, that's that's a very specific requirement. And they had a lot of dogs that did a lot of those things, but they didn't have a single dog that did all of them. And so that is an example of a breed that represents a very specific people, culture, and time in history. A purpose-bred dog is today, and, and they're trying to meet the needs of today, 2022, not 1880, right? And so they are doing a lot of the same things. And when we talk about purebred dogs, we need to acknowledge, accept the fact that in the most part, purebred dogs developed as at the hands of man, for lack of, or mankind, for lack of a better term, and that there was natural selection to a particular environment, right, or a particular job, but that people chose in many cases, which animals would be bred to the other animals to accomplish that natural selection. There are instances of land races and other things, but that's a that's a basic. Um, so that's one thing that we can talk about. We can all talk. We can also talk about the goals. The goals of a purebred dog breeder versus a purpose-bred dog breeder. Um, the goal of a purebred dog breeder is to preserve the breed standard that was created to describe the dog that did its job the best, whatever its job was, whether it was herding sheep or sitting on your lap looking adorable. Okay, The goal of a purpose-bred dog is performance. Well, there's some crossover right there, right? So a purpose-bred dog is to perform work to achieve a goal. In many cases, purebred dogs are doing the same thing. Not all but many. Um, another question that we can argue about or discuss um, or bring different um, considerations is that there are some who believe that a goal of purebred dogs is only appearance and that purpose-bred dogs is only function. And I would argue that, that neither of those total extremes is true, that, that there's a lot of gray area there. So we can talk about that. We can talk about confirmation and temperament, which I think is really, really critical. A purebred dog breeds true. In other words, when you mate to Spinonia Italiano and you have a litter of Spinonia Italiano, their confirmation and their basic size, their coat, their temperament, their basic, everything about them as a basic concept is that's what those puppies are going to be. When you are breeding a purpose-bred dog or a cross-bred dog, that isn't necessarily a priority to make a, a particular shoulder angulation or a particular head shape. That it's not a priority besides can they do the job. So 
there are places in which purebred and purpose-bred also cross in this area. Um, the color is another part of this. In a purebred dog, that's part of the standard. In a purpose-bred dog, it's not a priority. Temperament, as we mentioned. Um, are the breeders willing to cull? In other words, place pet puppies or potentially euthanize um, puppies that aren't going to perform as they wanted. The difference between purebred and purpose-bred is pretty eh, not as big there. I mean, bigger there than it is in other places. Sorry, my bad. Um, the people that you're selling the dogs to, the client, if you will, the puppy buyer of a purebred dog wants that particular breed. They want those known quantities. They want the size and the shape and the color and the, and the temperament. Um, the, the puppy buyer and a purpose bred or potentially crossbred dog needs a job, a specific job or an activity done. And, and they don't care about the extra stuff that goes with that. Are the dogs going to work in a purebred dog? Maybe in a purpose bred or crossbred, not necessarily crossbred exclusively, but in a purpose bred dog, absolutely. So again, a little crossover there. And then there's some education about the puppy buyers. Um, and I, again, this is one we can talk about. I think that the, there's a wider, um, a wider idea here than, than just, you know, a purebred dog only educates to their lines and the purpose-bred dog educates to general goals, not to the individual line or dogs. So, I mean, there's some, some real good nuanced stuff to discuss here. And I'm really excited about this concept. Um, okay, so so another another thing to think about, the purebred dogs that are also purpose-bred um, that do exist 100% are frequently going to be hunting dogs, hounds, bird dogs, some of the working dogs, some of the terriers. And keeping in mind that the toys and, and a few of the non-sporting dogs were bred intentionally as companions. So they are absolutely fulfilling the purpose for which they were bred, right? So here we go. And now we are going to bring in our special guest this evening, sorry for my nose itch, Natalie Thurman, who is uh, a Pure Dog Talk patron. She is also the phenom behind the tech abilities that have made this a much more um, listener friendly operation when we do the live at five. Natalie breeds Anatolian shepherds and she has also bred purpose bred cross bred dogs. Is that correct, Natalie? That's correct. <laughs> I can hear the crosses and the hissing. So don't worry, guys. stop, stop. Remember, we're all friends. Wait, stop. Let's be polite. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So Natalie, talk to us a little bit and, and with as much and Sherry, you're absolutely right about bloodhounds, hundred percent. And there are many, any number of breeds for which that is absolutely the case, both purebred and purpose-bred. So Natalie, talk to us about your experience, because I think you have kind of a really, not unique, but um, valuable um, experience that we can share with the audience about working with both purebred and intentionally crossbred dogs to do a livestock guardian role. So share a little bit about your experience with that. Sure. Um, well, back in 2010, I moved to Montana, where everything wants to eat your goats. And um, I decided that I needed a livestock guardian dog. So I contacted no fewer than 10 Anatolian shepherd breeders because I thought that was the breed that I needed in my life. Um, I did happen to be 22. That was not helpful to my case, turns out. Um, and basically, I, I got, you know, told no repeatedly in exciting and new ways, but the answer was the same. Um, the only person who told me yes was like, yeah, for five grand, I'll send, like, sell you a dog. And I'm like, I'm 22. I don't know what five grand is. Um, so <laughs> to protect my $400 a piece goats, it didn't really make sense to lay out five grand on a puppy, uh, especially when I didn't know what I was doing. So I, um, 
I found a more local source for a three-quarter Anatolian, one-quarter Great Pyrenees uh, puppy. <laughs> that was, um, uh, they were willing to sell to me, which, um, you know, not every 22-year-old is created equal, okay? Um, but it turned out great. Uh, he was really good. And I did end up having a lot of people come and buy goats, buy chickens, other things. Whilst they were here, they're like, what is that? You know, and it became a, that's my lifestyle garden dog. He's great. And they were like, when will you have puppies? To which case I had to be like, he's a male. He will never have birthing puppies. We just don't have that. So after about the 15th person who asked that question, I was like, okay, we'll find a female then. <laughs> So um, we started breeding crosses. I, you know, started out basically selling to my neighbors and friends who just needed dogs. It wasn't a, a goal of higher power trying to save a breed. It was trying to save goats. And then um, I just, you know, eventually got here um, the way I garnered trust with the real Anatolian breeders was that I was health testing and temperament testing my purpose bred crosses which uh, no one else was really doing. So, <laughs> which was frustrating for me because then I couldn't really bring in known quantity, known variables, which is why I shifted towards the purebred because right. when you're gambling every time you bring in a new dog, it's annoying. <laughs> it's a challenge. It's absolutely a challenge, Natalie. And I think you've really kind of touched on some of the challenges that come when you're doing crossbreeding versus breeding purebred dogs. I mean, those are just legitimate challenges. And I think that um, Kitty makes a really great point when we talk about our existing breeds that have found new purpose, right? So a Great Dane is not out hunting boars today, right? Nope. It's just not. But it I has. I don't know one that, that does. It, 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 yeah, <laughs> I'm saying it's not a thing. Um, and but the breed has found popularity as a fabulous companion, as a you know not very. Um, fierce guard dog, but big, right? Intimidating. Um, intimidating. Sure. That's a great way to say it. Um, I think about, you know, the Lauchen that was bred to, you know, catch the fleas on the royal lady's legs. Like they're not doing that today. We all have frontline, right? So, I'm but they, free. again, have a fabulous job as companions and they run agility and they do all the fun things. So, you know, I think that the most important conversation that I want to have in this topic is that we are not one another's enemies. And that is a hard space. And so I understand you've got a lot of feels on this one. So I want to give you, I know you got a lot of feels on this one. So I want to give you the floor to gently share some of, <laughs> some of your experience. And more importantly, than that, then the experience is your takeaway and, and what we can take with that to go forward. Yeah. Um, so I, I attended the national specialty for the Anatolians last year and I was asked point blank if my crosses were better guardian dogs than my purebreds. And I said, no, which shocked, I think the people <laughs> who asked the question and then they're like, well, why do you even have them or breed them then if they're not better? And I had to explain to them that, you know, it's not always about better. It's about accessibility. Where there is a need that is not filled, like nature abhors a vacuum and so do farmers. So we will fill that vacuum. And I had a dog vacuum and I filled it with crosses because that's all I could get because that's all anyone would trust me with. So, so I think there's right there, Natalie, let's pause on that one for just half a second. <laughs> so no, deep. seriously, I, no, no, because this one's really important. It is a statement to all of us who breed dogs, who are so freaking, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And I Precious. understand that we've all been burnt. Yeah. Trust me when I say we've all been burnt. Me, no less than anybody else. And there's good reason for the, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. But at some point, we have got to, in our community, take responsibility and say, people want a dog. 
They yeah. don't want to give you a kidney in order to have that dog. Yeah. They just want a dog. And there's a reason that the, the average member of the population is out there buying doodles that everybody in our community screams about or crossbred livestock guardian dogs because they can get them. Yep. And here is a perfect example sitting in front of you of someone who is and will continue to be a phenomenal member of the purebred dog community who was pushed by necessity into a crossbred dog. Now, she's come forward, she's moved on, whatever, you know, however we want to say that, she's out of the closet. It's not process working for me, so not completely my out. Point, <laughs> my point is, at some point, we have to own some of this. And that's a fact. I try really hard when people apply for a puppy with me. I'm strict, but I try to be fair and think back to how I was treated. And I do my best not to treat anybody the way I was treated. And I think that that is something that we can suggest to everyone. Yeah. You know, you don't want so many doodles in your groom shop. Sell them a damn dog. A poodle. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, mean I'm going to say once a month, once a month, I um, have a conversation with Trupanion, like part of my job description, part of my contract with Trupanion is Trupanion, once a month, Trupanion. I meet with their, it's Trupanion, once a month, I meet with their um, breeder support program employees, and we talk about all kinds of stuff. And so one of the things that we did this month was talk about different breeds that people wanted to know about. And one of the, one of the guys, one of the employees wanted to know about, um, I can't remember what the breed was. Oh, Legato, because he wanted to be able to talk to people in his social circle, not necessarily in his job about purebred dogs that are like doodles. And so next month we're doing what I like to call the alt doodle presentation, which is, which is if you like the concept of a pick a doodle, whatever your doodle is. If you like that concept, if you like the fluffy and the cute and the boot to do, and you want to preserve a breed, here are breeds that actually are really for real non-shedding. Right. Wow. Um, and so before, before I get yelled at by the people who are saying I'm picking on the crossbred community, I'm not picking on the um, doodle breeders that health test and that are honest with their buyers. Yeah. And they're, they do people. exist. They are real. Exist. And that, that is something that I think we need to focus on and, mm -hmm. and comment on because it's real easy because so many people in our community are so violently anti doodle and I'm really not what I am opposed to is unethical breeders of any shape, form or fashion or stripe. Plenty of people breeders honest, don't health test either. Plenty of them or not honest about their dogs or what have you. That That isn't exclusive to doodle breeders. Yeah. Um, so unethical breeders of any stripe are a problem for me. If yeah. you are breeding um, a poodle to a Bernese mountain dog and you're gonna tell your buyers that these are absolutely definitely gonna be- Non-shedding, hypoallergenic. Non-shedding, hypoallergenic dogs, you're lying because you can't know that. And also 40 because pounds. Dog with hair, to a dog with fur. Yeah. And if you tell your owners, as I have had many owners come into a groom shop and tell me that the breeder said, you don't have to brush it. It's anti, it doesn't shed. Da, da, da. If you're telling your buyers that you're lying and you're not ethical. Yeah. That is my problem is not the concept that you've bred these two breeds. It is that you're lying to people. And I think if you are honest and speak within the purebred dog community, most of the people are going to, be on that same page. If you're just honest and you're ethical and you're responsible and you're doing the health testing for the breeds that are involved in your crossbred program, great. Yeah. Um, absolutely, Katie. The undoodle, the otter hound. Um, I think of Barbets. I think of Spinoni. I think of um, uh, Legato. I think of Poodle. Bichon. I think of Portuguese water dogs. I think of Poodles. Just get a Poodle. Entire <laughs> I, I have an entire presentation that is alt doodle. And so we are going to go back to the same place we started in this conversation, which is that people will buy 
a purebred dog if someone will sell it to them. If you let them. And yeah. that's on us. And as Natalie mentioned earlier, nature abhors a vacuum and so does the marketplace. People yeah. want to purchase dogs. And so we have created within our community this mindset that if you have more than one litter every five years or a puppy mill and you should die and no one can buy your dog because they're never going to be good enough unless they give you a solid gold plated alibi. And we have created what we are reaping what we have sown is what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Thoughts on and yes, that. a lot of the rarer breeds that resemble a doodle are very rare and doodles are not rare and very readily available, especially this year, because two years ago, everyone decided I'm going to buy a poodle and I'm going to buy two other things and I'm going to be rich, baby. <laughs> oh. Sad but true. Um, and I think that more than anything, um, what we need is more dog breeders. Yeah. And it doesn't That's have to be purebred. There are people who do Just responsible. Responsible. Yeah. There are people who go out every single weekend and their entire life is about fly ball or dock diving or hunting birds. And if that's your thing, that is a purpose that a dog can fulfill. If you try to have your kid, your human child, play fly ball, he will never win or title. <laughs> I tried. Well, and there's so many, I, it's one of the things that I love, particularly in the last, what, 10 years, AKC has really, really upped their game in terms of the games that they play for people. And they who allow crosses. The ring. And there are crosses competing in them. So again, responsible breeders, breeding healthy dogs and being honest Yes. With their puppy buyers is what and educating, we need. preparing educating them for life the with this puppy about the proper grooming requirements and the proper socialization requirements and all of those things. Those are the things we need. Um, so Katie has a great question, and I I will answer it, and then I'm going to be interested to hear what what Natalie has to say because she's um, my marketing guru. So I love that. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> um. Katie's question is, what's the best way to educate about quality breeders? And so I talk to people that are asked, I mean, I just today just placed one of my adult dogs that was just not, she was washed out in the field. She's nice enough to finish, but not required. I love her health testing, but I have her sister that's as good. I, I don't need her. Hmm. So I'm going to put her in a lovely pet home. And so I was talking to the people and they had great questions. So your answers are going to be, um, what's the dog's health? So you talk about the health testing that you've done, right? Their questions are, what is her socialization or training? So you talk about how you raise your puppies with early neurological stimulation and um, early socialization and early scent discrimination, all of the things that we do, DHA, all of the things that we do as responsible breeders of any animal, mm -hmm. period, to make a great socially acceptable, well-rounded companion, because facts are facts. The number of people who need a livestock guardian to save their goats are limited to Montana and Texas. And there's like six of them. I'm being, I'm exaggerating for a fact, but you understand my point. The percentage of people who need a purely functional working dog are minimal. And the number of people who need a companion that will also do a job is huge, yeah. vast, practically unending. The most recent numbers that I've seen, both from the American Kennel Club and every other source that I can find, is that in the United States alone, there is an estimated demand, the marketplace demand for replacement animals. So a new puppy is on the order of 9 million dogs a year. That's a lot of dogs. Okay. That's a lot of dogs. Happens so the American Kennel Club registers roughly a million a year. Yeah. Where's that. the rest of them coming from? Chunk will go to UKC. The rest are going to 
interesting. Well, but I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying, right? These are these are backyard accidental street dogs, shelter dogs, you name it. Mm -hmm. And so, as much as I love a shelter dog, and I've owned any number of them, they all come with baggage. They none of them started out with early neurological stimulation and um, early socialization and scent discrimination and handling and a great diet and vaccination and worming and proper traction in their whelping box, all of the things that a responsible breeder of any breed does. And so you start at a deficit with these dogs. So that's what I educate buyers about, about quality breeders. That's me. Natalie? Ooh, so I'm, I'm looking, I have a infographic that I've made. Oh, beautiful. So many, maybe many moons ago it, and it's like, hiding in my comment. can, but it's safe. I'll find it later. Um, we'll send we'll send that in the in the comments once we post this up on the Facebook page. How's that? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is on the Facebook page. It just it just is. But I'll I'll find I'll track it down and put it up. But I'm saying once once this we're done and it's posted, you can add it to the comments. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I can I can post a link. So basically, it starts out with um you know at the top it's like okay. Does the breeder have references? Check those out. Do you know what your breed requirements are for chick certification? And I have do a little Do you know what link. chick certification is? Chick certification. I'm saying, do they, that's one of the questions. Do they yeah, know what so it, it is? Yeah, so it's a link and I tell them to search their breed and it will have required and then it will have recommended health testing for a given breed. If it's a Labradoodle, you have to look up a Labrador and then you have to look up a Poodle. You cannot just look up one. Um, so you have extra work if you're doing crossbred with dogs that have known health issues. Not all of them overlap. You still have to test for it. Um, so after that, and a, a chick certification does not mean the dog is healthy. It does not mean the dog passed. What it means. It just means that they did the tests and reported them publicly. They checked the box to not be shady, which we are trying to encourage, right? Yes, um, they OFA, when you submit hip x-rays, for example, if your dog fails or, you know, bilaterally or unilaterally, they will not post those results unless you checked the box saying, post them even if they're awful. Which so many breeders will not do. Right. So it's important. It shows more than the dog is health than the dog is like, you know, past and healthy. It shows the ethics of the breeder who owns that dog. Not necessarily who produced the dog. Whoever owns that dog and tested that dog did the right thing, essentially. Yep. Even if the dog failed. Yep. Um, which is important. And that's a great way to eliminate a lot of breeders from your uh, list of screening right off the top. Right off the top, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, I go through how where are they whelped. For livestock guardian dogs, this is really big. There is a camp of humans who believe that you should not touch the puppies. They should be allowed to dig a den in the dirt during flood season and have their puppies where they want to and mom doesn't let you touch them. And that's totally normal. That's all their instincts, don't you know? <laughs> yeah. So I'm not in that camp, obviously. I sound really judgmental. This is my easy well box right back here. It yeah. is in my office, in my house, where humans sleep. Um, it is not in the barn. If I had a nice barn, some people have like nicer barns than I have a house. So if you're on that level, go with God. Ha have your litters in your nicer barn than my house. I don't. I have a shack of a barn. And then I have a eh, house. So they're in the in house. <laughs> I don't know. It looks like a pretty nice wood home behind you. So I'm saying. Thank you. No comment. So, okay. Uh, so we look at testing. We look at where they're whelped. And right? then I want you and to then, meet at least mom and yeah, see what her temperament is like. Yep. It's not, everyone used to say it was a red flag to not meet mom and dad. Well, uh, my main bitch, uh, her dad died in like 2001. Real well, awkward. If you can meet him. Person, or from dogs outside. I mean, I actually find it more of a red flag if you've got mom and dad on the property. <laughs> because mm -hmm. I want people that are really seeking to accomplish a thing. 
And so it's the same to- dad as the dad of eight litters in a row. Right. Yeah. Seeking to accomplish a thing means that you're going to use a dog outside of your house most of the time. True. True. And um, yeah, so after that, I want to know how the puppies are raised. Do you do ENS? Do you know why? A lot of people say it, it you know, it's proven. I'm like, yeah, is it? <laughs> I tell people it doesn't hurt and it can only help. Right. And, and I do believe that there is a lot of science behind it. It's when I started doing it long before it was famous or puppy culture or any other thing, I learned most of the components of it from a fellow who was a canine handler in the military in um, World War II. And that's where most of them started. And so Mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of useful information there. And I think it's important for us to understand that and recognize it and reward it. Um, So that's, that's a thing. Um, I also, you know, so we look at the health testing, we look at how they're whelped and raised we look at, meet the parents, meet the temperament, understand that so much about a puppy is based on its maternal influence. There's, there's an X factor there that is critical. Um, so we need to think about that. What are some of the other things you think about? Um, so if it's a, if it's an AKC breed, they're going to have a breed club because you don't get a breed in AKC without a club. So like Denise, says right here uh look up their parent club they will have a breeder referral list and if they don't have a list published you can always contact that usually the secretary will send you a nice put of a full of humans that you can contact it'll probably be phone numbers because if there's one thing that dog clubs don't do it's join this century dog people dog people in general There's, there's a whole nother thing that we can talk about in another date. And don't join in the them, 21st century folks. Just join up. I, as a matter of fact, these people I was talking to today about this adult dog, they were so impressed. They're like, Oh my God, your website is so beautiful. And I'm thinking, dude, it's pretty random, but okay. <laughs> Thank Compared you. To Take me, a compliment. It is. <laughs> Compared. Well, they were talking about my kennel website, but you know, it's, it's really, it really is something we all need to be better about. And I know it's hard to find the time or the money or what have you, but we live in the 21st century. That's how people make their decisions. And mm-hmm. if the doodle breeder down the street has a fancy schmancy, high graphic video drama, blah, 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 beautiful and they do. You know, with flowers they do. and they do, um, that's how people are going to make their decisions. Yeah. Facts. Facts and evidence. And photography. Yes. <laughs> Angles. What's in the background? Um, but no, but when you're looking at breeders seriously, and I think you need to call them before you tell them you're looking for a puppy, call them and ask them a question. Right. I and not in your breed. Your Would you recommend it for someone in my situation? Right. Right. Introduce yourself. Tell them. I live in an apartment in Manhattan. Is a wire hair a good fit for me? No. No. <laughs> like, no. If they hang up no, on you, that's no. rude, but hopefully they educate Just you no. a little bit. <laughs> um, and I thought Cindy made an interesting comment in here that the um, Labradoodle concept um, has now been sort of developed into six breeds. This is something I had not heard. This is interesting. Um, that they're have a club seeking uniformity and a new name. And she says that she thinks that's the cobber dog. So if anybody else has any information on that, I'd love to know more about that. I do know that the golden doodle specifically that group of responsible. And, and I know there are people here who are going to scream, but there are responsible breeders. We can't hear them. It's fine. Dogs. I can't hear them screaming. Okay, good. Um, there are responsible breeders of crossbred dogs, and the Golden Doodles have a national club and are and they have, they to- rate based on the amount and appropriateness of the health testing that has been um, done. There are tiers. Right. I think they have three or four tiers. Yep. So you can so be a breeder really- at the lowest tier, or you can be a breeder at the highest tier. And if a customer probably doesn't understand or know that, so it's up right. to the breeder to educate. I am actually on the highest tier. (laughs) And so I think that bottom line of this entire conversation, you know, circling, circling to the beginning again, is that we, we, all of us here, 
there's not an enormous uh, number of us watching live, but there's gonna be a lot more of y'all that watch it later. All of us have got to learn how to get along in our tiny little sandbox because our sandbox shrinks every day and every month and every year. And yeah. it is absolutely real. And if we are to survive in the passion that we have for our dogs, whether we are breeding poodles, doodles, or border collie whippet things to run, to run agility, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, those are, that's another purpose bred type of cross, right? There's a ton of different people doing different things. And the bottom line is we are all trying to do the best we can for our dogs. Some of us are doing better at it than others. And instead of trying to sink everybody else's ship, perhaps we could try raising everyone up to the same level, which is education. It is educating those breeders. It is, I, I, there are many, 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 many things um, that I find faulty about the, my former organization with which I am no longer associated and which will remain unnamed. Voldemort. But, yeah, that is, that is one of the things that I really do believe and really support is that concept of a rising tide raises all boats. And we, as responsible purebred dog breeders or responsible crossbred dog breeders, are all in the same tide. Mm -hmm. And instead of sinking each other's boats and throwing rocks and shooting missiles at the water line, right? Let's try to educate each other, help each other, recognize the value that each of us brings. And one of the things that I thought was really kind of interesting um, that we were talking about earlier, the and 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 uh, Katie mentioned it actually, that the purebred dogs that were created for a purpose, right? that don't necessarily do that purpose that have found other jobs. So the otter hounds that are doing narcotics work or search and rescue, for example, right? Wire Very hair pointers. useful. Yeah, absolutely. Wire hair pointers and short hair pointers are in huge demand in narcotics detection and explosives detection. They're being used in um, airports around the country. I see more, far more wire hairs and short hairs than I see labs far mm -hmm. and away. Um, because they have a particular type of drive that's very useful in that that was developed to do their actual original job. And now it mm. has been repurposed. And so repurposing is a these, thing and it doesn't ruin a breed. No, no, it absolutely doesn't. It saves the breed. And it saves it, mm. <laughs> you know, and I, and I really think that that's a thing. And so one of the things that I really would encourage people to do is while I understand we all feel the same aggravation about <clears throat> um, dogs that come into our groom shops in poor condition, um, instead of blaming that on, you know, giving it a shorthand name, we can talk about responsible breeders, responsible owners, um, and their and their responsibilities. And those are responsibilities that apply to purebred, crossbred, purposebred, any bred, anyone who is producing a dog on purpose has a responsibility to the people who will eventually buy that dog. And all of the people, every single person who owns any dog of any breeding has responsibility to care for that dog properly. So educating the breeders about how to breed better dogs, educating the buyers about how to be better owners, all of those things are going to be what saves us from having more dogs in shelters. More dogs isn't the problem. More dogs in shelters is a problem. The dogs that wind up in shelters are dogs that are poorly bred, poorly socialized, poorly maintained, owned by people who are irresponsible. And then dumped. Mm -hmm. And the, do the people who produce those dogs never pay for it. Yep. Because they don't take Only the dogs, dogs back. pay for it. So. Only the dogs pay for it. So I really, I really want us to, as a community, talk about this more. Lean into it. Own it. Carry it forward with us to our other circles. 
because if we are to have the ability to own anything that is not the random pit mix that's in the shelter, um, it's on us to do a better job. Yeah. I think how we start is the next time your best friend starts talking about doodles, the way they like to talk about doodles that is not constructive or helpful. Just stop them or leave. Yeah. Yeah. We have a definite culture of really crap talking crosses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And And that's, and that's my point. We we really need to stop, but I'm going to say the crop there's, it's there's mutual. a mutual there's a mutual community here right there's yeah. a mutual responsibility purebred people need to stop the the smack talk to the doodles and the crossbreds but as i mentioned at the beginning the entire thing was all about purebred hate yeah and and they're and inbred hate. they're not oh, healthy as our dogs okay, well that's not you're you're still not doing anybody any favors guys yeah this is a mutual this is a two-way street and mm-hmm. and understand that in a world in an environment in a country in which hatred and division and and all of those things are rampant and unending and potentially devastating we absolutely have got to get our shit together in this community both together <laughs> um Garnet makes a super great point, um, educating vets. I know that I was part of a group of people, um, Pat Hastings, God rest her soul, Chris Levy, Nancy Martin, and I did a presentation to the Oregon State University veterinary students at a dog show. We gave them a whole presentation about purebred dogs. We walked them around. We showed them the dogs. And and it was it was really, really valuable because right now, the vast majority of <clears throat> money in veterinary colleges is coming from the animal rights agenda and shelter medicine is the most popular uh, major or specialty practice. And so when we asked the question of the 20 kids that were in that group, if any of them were interested in theriogenology, one of them almost raised her hand, but she was scared that somebody would see it. Yeah. One. That's sad. And that's a fact. And it's not, it's not unusual. I know the American Kennel Club and its infinite wisdom is actually really trying on this one. And I give them a lot of props. Like they've got to try. We all have to try. If you have any access into any vet school anywhere, use it. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. So there's Kate's comment, my random pit mix, who I love, but is the reason I want, need a purebred dog next time. Talk to anybody yeah. that's, that's lived the life of unhealthy mentally unsound, all the things that come with it. Um, yeah. And so Garnet's point about educating, that's hundred percent Diane's point about educating at her shop, right? So Diane's a groomer. And so when we talk to our clients, instead of just, you know, throwing them the doodle fee, which is like a hundred bucks worth of aggravation added on to everything else, because that's how we feel when the dog comes in matted to the skin. And the only thing we can do is a 40 kennel because it's matted to the skin because it has hair that has uh, been had fur shed into it and it has made felt. And there is no way, nothing that can be done, but to shave it to the skin. And that's a and quality people, of life issue. That's not even like an aggravation issue. That's a big quality no, of life. It's literally issue I mean, over the, over the course of time that I worked pet grooming, I had, um, dogs so matted that they had created abscesses that then had maggots in them. And that is not something unique to me. Ask any professional groomer, professional pet groomer, and they will tell you that's normal. That's Um, awful. That should not be normal. It is awful and it is normal. Uh, And so understand where pet groomers are coming from because they are so frustrated and they started in this job because they love the animals and all they see is the animals essentially being abused yeah. and, and that's not okay. And that's not a dog breeder's fault. No, <laughs> um, but that is their fault. as breeders, yeah. the most you can give them is set them up for reality, not fantasy. Mm-hmm. And that includes education, education and, and, and not, and not lie to them, whether you're selling yeah. them a, 
an old English sheepdog or uh, some particular crossbred dog. You have got to be honest. And if you have to lie to sell your dogs, then, then you're probably falling into the category of not a very responsible breeder of any particular brand name. Yeah. That? Is that fair? I, I think it's fair. <laughs> I take a lot of phone calls for support for other people's dogs. Right. Because they won't answer phone calls once they cash your check. And that's pitiful. And that's wrong. And, um, and whether you're purebred or crossbred breeder, it's wrong. Period. Yeah. And the owner's um, not always the problem. <laughs> so, Nicola, absolutely. You are 100% on point. And I think that you speak for all of us. And I, I would like to read Nicola's comment because I think it's really, really valid. And I happen to think Nicola's a, a pretty smart lady. So, let me see if I can fit uh, it. Yeah. So you can fit it in there. Good job. All right. Nicholas says, I'm a dog lover, full stop. Purebred, purpose-bred, pedigree, or crossbred. I am not a lover of ill-bred dogs, pedigree, or crossbreed, nor of profiteering greeters of any breed, pure or mixed. Health and temperament are key in any realm, and the benefit of breeding purebred kennel club registered dogs is the capacity to be able to follow the paper trail and authenticate health status through the health test records. Perhaps bringing registrations of purpose-bred crossbreeds under the umbrella of our country's respective kennel clubs will help pave the way for responsible breeding and support potential owners, finding responsible breeders of both pure and purpose-bred dogs and lessen the demand for indiscriminate careless breeders. I think now Nicola, I know is not in the U S but I think that's a really interesting conversation. Um, I know that when it has been um, discussed within the confines of the American Kennel Club, there have been blood curdling screams. Some of you might remember, no, I mean blood curdling. Some of you might remember the conversation when it was proposed that junior handlers could be able to show crossbred dogs in junior showmanship and the blood curdling screams that em emitted from that when people's heads exploded. Um, and, and it was, it was really not the fancy's best moment. Many people were showcased to be very elitist and the worst of what we are on our worst day. And it was really disappointing. So I, you know, Nicola, I, I think it's an interesting concept. I, I do not foresee a day in my particular lifetime that it will happen within the American Kennel Club. No. Sad, but, um, I really don't. Um, uh, da, da, da. Purpose bread mix is the first dog I ever bought from a breeder and it's the most stable dog. Okay, so this is really interesting from D. Do you see this one? Good. Um, D says she has two rescues and one purpose bred mix that came from a health tested parents. My purpose bred mix is the first dog I've ever bought from a breeder and he's the most stable dog I've ever met. I love my other mutts, but they definitely have issues that could have been prevented if they weren't brought into this world by irresponsible people. May I just bring giant emphasis to those last two words um, because I am going to be the first one to tell you, and I believe most of you here will agree, that it's almost never the dog's fault. 99.98% of the time, it is not a dog's fault. Whatever it is that's going on with the dog is not the dog's fault. It's an irresponsible person's fault. Whether it was an irresponsible breeder an irresponsible owner or a combination thereof. That dog is a, in most cases, a victim. And sadly, in many cases, um, winds up as a, as a behavioral euthanasia yeah. or a health euthanasia as a result. And so that dog loses its life because someone else is irresponsible. And so D kudos to you because purpose bred mix is fine. So long as it's stable, it's great. And I think your point of irresponsible people is 100% on, on target. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Diane's talking about junior handling and, and I, I agree with that. And I, I yeah. caught my ration of grief for it. Um, but I will stand for that every single time. I am actually giddy that the solution that the American Kennel Club landed on, which is to go back to the, policy of allowing juniors to show any dog, whether their name is on it or not. Um, that's where they landed in order to resolve the blood curdling screams and head explosions. I'm actually super fine with that too. Um, I, I just think that um, 
the controversy in itself really did not showcase the the purebred dog fancy in good light. It's a high I, barrier I, of entry for juniors when they have to own the dog that they show. Absolutely. And that's why the solution is, that they came, that they finally went back to, I think is the right one. Yeah, honestly. I agree. Um, and it, it's a fine, perfectly workable solution and solves all the problems. And I'm sure so, everyone who had blood curling screams is letting juniors is their dogs. About this. And many of them are giving people dogs to show hundred percent. Hundred um, percent, and that and so it's a great solution. Absolutely. Um, if kids okay, don't start showing, no one's going to be showing in twenty years. So, it's, <laughs> I I have seen a lot. I just judged juniors this weekend. Phenomenal kids. Oh my gosh, talk about really great, really dedicated young people. Many of whom were showing their dogs in the breed ring as well as in juniors. Um, it, it was really phenomenal. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, Larissa, that's a, that's a really amazing and on point statement. And I think that I, I hear that from a lot of people and I'm going to only emphasize the one thing that I said before, the only way everybody else is going to be able to own a well-bred, healthy dog of any variety, whether it be purebred crossbred is if we encourage more people to breed dogs and, um, that's, that's a hard, that's a hard sell right now in today's society. So I want to offer a community group hug to all of us who are here and say, it's okay. You're, you're allowed hundred percent allowed to be a dog breeder, encouraged even. And Please breed I, your healthy health tested and temperament tested dog. Yep. Right. <laughs> Right. Responsible program, proven health tested dogs. That's, that's what it boils down to. So purebred, purpose bred, often the same thing. Mm -hmm. Responsibly bred, most important. And most rare. Um, I, less rare than, than I think sometimes we can feel in our, in our bitter inside moments, but yeah, rarer than it should be. We so all have different standards all... also for what responsible means. <laughs> Exactly. And you have to and understand I, and what you want. Conversation, what does responsible mean? Um, and, and honestly, I'm going to throw this into the, into the um, uh, fire, like a, like a cherry bomb with three minutes remaining. Um, I don't <laughs> believe that a dog has to have a title to be responsibly bred. Thank you. Most of mine are not. I'm saying the, the fact is that just being a show champion or being a field hunt test champion or whatever it is, right? It is okay. It is 100% acceptable to breed healthy, responsibly raised companion animals. And not every champion has good hips or whatever. <laughs> right. And, 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 and as much as I love the game of showing dogs, um, and as much as I love the game of testing my dog's abilities, because that's something that matters to me. Um, <laughs> Kate, you are a hundred percent right, honey. I can tell you, I've been doing it for most of my adult life and m much of my childhood. That's why and you get a mentor. I guarantee you, the more I learn, the more I don't know anything. And every time I have a litter, I learn something new and I'm like, how did this never happen before? But it didn't. <laughs> and so, um, it's just, it's just a thing. And I, and I think that we can all walk away tonight and just commit to the concept of not leading the rabble rousing, rabid torch bearing attack dog status towards anyone of another, um, breeding persuasion, if you will. I don't know. That's probably sounds weird, but you, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying no, we're not, we're not putting that on swag. Never your That's breeding not. persuasion. Yeah, That's not what we're doing. Um, but just, just like, I'm going to go back to yesterday's podcast. Just be nice y'all. Like it is not that freaking hard. And I know it's frustrating. I know we get worn down in as groomers or as whatever, but let's talk about irresponsible people and not bash whatever particular class of animal that we're complaining about and build up the good ones and encourage that sort of behavior. Yep. Yep. Um, okay. 
All right, so we are at um, time's up. And Natalie tried to tell me I should fit all of this into half an hour. Listen to me. I'm just saying, Natalie, who was right on this one? You were. <laughs> and it's on record. It's on record. Ooh. All right. Peace out, peeps. Um, I'm, it's great to have you all here on our live at five. Join us next month. We have a very special guest with very special prizes. You guys, I'm so excited about this one. Um, coming to us from England with a new board game, our guest. I know it's a perfect holiday gift. So just saying, whoop, whoop. Um, and uh, stop by and join us in the patrons group. We have a lot of fun. All right. Night, y'all.